Hi everyone, welcome to my channel. In the last video, I measured RPM using an interrupt that was triggered by the blades attached to a DC motor shaft. And when the blades broke the beam on an opto sensor, it created a square wave. And that would trigger the interrupt. So two of the options for an interrupt is you can use the uh, leading edge of a square wave or the falling edge. And if we blow this up a little bit more, it's important that this edge be nice and square on the square wave because you don't want false triggering or false interrupts. And if you were to have false interrupts uh, for the example with the RPM calculation, you would have too many interrupts per second or per minute and your calculation for RPM would be off. So you have to make sure you have a nice clean square wave. Now that's not a problem uh, with an encoder or the opto sensor because you end up that's solid state and you end up with a nice square pulse. But that can be a problem when you're using a switch or a button or a mechanical contact. So switches, just because of their mechanical nature, tend to be noisy before they settle into the state that you're selecting. So if we used a pull-up resistor with a switch, so we had 5 volts and a resistor and a switch, and then we were looking at this point here with an interrupt, and this was to ground. So we'd have 5 volts here, and then when this button was pressed in, this would go to zero. So if we were using an interrupt that was going to trigger on the falling edge of a square wave with a switch, before, because of the nature of the switch, uh, the contact is going to be a little bit intermittent at first. So you could have some glitches in here that go to zero and then back up to the five volts, zero to the five volts before finally the switch settles to its zero volts with a closed position permanently. And that's just the nature, probably, you know, microscopically or mechanically, however it's uh, assembled. Uh, you know, you might have metals that have bumps and stuff in here. There might be particles of dirt. And there's a certain amount of pressure that you have to apply before, only, before you finally get the, the good contact um, and you, you get that short, so you, you, you create that ground and, or that closed position and you get your zero. So you'll have these glitches here and the interrupt will detect those. So you'll get some extra interrupts that you do not want. So what you can do is you can put a capacitor across the switch and the capacitor will hold a charge so if we still had the pull-up resistor and let's say over here we have the switch to ground we could put a capacitor across this switch and before this switch is closed say we had 5 volts over here and a 10k resistor this capacitor will charge up to 5 volts so it'll be it'll be 5 volts right here and again this say this is going to the interrupt and we've got plus and minus well what happens if we sort of try to um, magnify this if we have these intermittent pulses before the switch actually settles to the closed position so this is the this is the true zero final contact is made and it's going to stay there when the switch is closed the capacitor when this closes now has a discharge path to ground and it'll discharge through this switch but it takes time so before this goes back up to 5 volts because it's intermittent short, 
it will maintain that 5 volts and those two portions there. So essentially it's filling in these little false gaps that are due to the mechanical nature of the switch. But there is a downside to that also in that when you finally reach this settling point here for going to zero, it's, it puts a little bit of a, of a slope here due to the time it takes to discharge. So that's the same slope that was in here. So you, you still, you don't have a nice sharp corner on this falling edge of the square wave or the pulse that you create when you press and close that switch. Another concern is that for a cheap switch, uh, because you're discharging this capacitor through this switch, uh, you could damage it. So it's a good idea to also put a resistor in series with this switch to sort of reduce the likelihood of causing some damage. And also by adding this extra resistor here, it slows down the rate of discharge for this capacitor. So the slope of this discharge in between these little gaps here really becomes very small. And this curve here is actually related to the RC time constant of this capacitor and this resistor. So when this is closed, this capacitor discharges through this resistor and eventually discharges to zero. And the time it takes to do that, you multiply the resistor value and the capacitor value, and it gives you the RC time constant. So this is equal to time. So with that capacitor and the resistor in place, you wouldn't even see those little glitches. So you'd end up looking, you'd have something like that. So the only concern we have now is to try to somehow resolve this and sharpen up that edge, which is sort of related to a comparator. And it has a trigger threshold where it'll switch high once you surpass a certain threshold voltage or switch low after you pass another threshold voltage it has two threshold voltages one of the one of the ways to illustrate how a schmidt trigger functions is that if we show a graph of the output voltage which can be positive v out and also a negative v out so in, in one respect, it's similar to an op amp. You'll have a plus and a minus voltage uh, that it can switch to depending on your supply voltages. And you have two threshold voltages. So here we have a plus threshold voltage. And here we have a minus threshold voltage. And the output or the state of the voltage that it switches to also uh, is dependent on a prior state. So if we're already at the positive voltage for an output, the plus voltage, once we reach this threshold, the output will switch to the opposite voltage. And if we want to go back to a plus voltage, we have to go through the to the other reference voltage. So backwards we would have to go back to this opposite or the second threshold and once that is reached it'll switch back to a positive voltage from the negative side. And in this case I have the thresholds on either side of zero reference but it doesn't need to be that way you can have it so this shifts either positive or negative. It's just, you know, the design of the circuit. In my case, I'm going to be using a 74 LS14, which is, uh, it has six Schmidt triggers on one IC.
It's also uh, an inverting Schmidt trigger. So it inverts the pulses that uh, go through it. This is also the symbol for a Schmidt trigger. So you'll see this symbol. It's sort of at an angle though. If I look at my vintage data book here, TTL data book. Look at a 7414. Here it is here. And you can see here hex Schmidt trigger inverters and it has six of them and you can see the symbols there for the Schmidt trigger. So here's the IC that I'm going to be using to help me get a nice square wave from a switch. This characteristic also of having two separate thresholds one to switch from a high to a low and another one to switch from a low to high is called hysteresis. So let me show you the circuit I built up with the RC network and a Schmidt trigger uh, that I've built on a Heathkit trainer. What I'm doing is I'm going to feed in a, a square wave at one hertz and that's going to simulate pressing the button or a switch on and off. So here's the circuit I've built on the Heathkit trainer and I'm using two 10k parts because I'm trying to show the worst case scenario and how the Schmidt trigger will clean up the waveform. It doesn't exactly uh, simulate the uh, mechanical switching portion of say a button or a switch uh, you know cleaning up those those glitches but it shows how the RC time constant, the sloping that occurs from the resistor and uh, capacitor combination gets cleaned up with the Schmidt trigger, the properties that the Schmidt trigger has. So this is a very slow sweep because I only have one hertz simulating the on off of a switch. So you can see it takes time to go from one channel to the next. Now this is the output from the Schmidt trigger and this is the worst case scenario for the input. You can see here the time constant. It takes time to get to the plus 5 volts as a sloping up to the 5 volts and then discharging. It has that discharge pattern when it discharges from 5 volts to 0. And you can see here on the output of the Schmidt trigger Let's clean that up and you have these nice clean square waves. Again that's the input to the Schmidt trigger and that's the corresponding output. And it's they're inverting Schmidt triggers so the waveform, the square wave is inverted. So you'd have to take that into account when using that on the interrupt. So when you press a button and you have a pull-up resistor and it goes from 5 to 0, you would then be inverting that and in the interrupt you would be looking for uh, the rising edge. You would be triggering on the rising edge from 0 to 5 volts. So the debouncing circuit that I have that's going to connect to the interrupt line on the UNO, I'm using pin 2, will be this 10k resistor, this is 5 volts, and it's a pull-up resistor, and then there's a 100 ohm resistor here, and here's this the button switch that we need to clean up the signal, the intermittent signal, and debounce the signal. Uh, we have a capacitor also across the switch and the resistor and this is an RC time constant which helps take out those glitches and then the slope is going to be taken care of by the Schmidt trigger so uh, here we'll have that Schmidt trigger and it has that symbol that will look like this 
and that gets fed to pin uh, 2, which is interrupt 0 on the Arduino. And then when this is pressed, so when this goes, to, when this goes from high to low, the output here will go from low to high. So let me show you the experiment that I have built up that I'm using this debouncing circuit with. So here's the experiment. I have the Arduino hooked up to an RGB LED and what it does is it takes a color and slowly increases the intensity and decreases the intensity of that particular color and when you first turn it on uh, it's at one color and with the interrupt you can switch the fading from one color to another color. So the normal flow of the sketch is slowly increasing and decreasing the intensity of that particular color and then you can switch colors by using this interrupt. And Because we have a mechanical switch here we want to use a debouncing circuit with an RC network here and also a Schmidt trigger and gives us a nice uh, clean edge that we can trigger off of for the interrupt. So that's a general explanation of how you can clean up the signal from a switch before you attach it to the interrupt pin on your Arduino. And if you found this video interesting, please subscribe, like, and or comment. And thanks for watching.